Jaya Radha Madhava Punjabi Hari Jaya Radha Madhava Punjabi Hari Gopi Janabalabha Girivaran Hari Jaya Gopi Janabalabha Girivaran Hari Yashoda Nandana Bajajana Ranjana Yashoda Nandana Bajajana Ranjana Yamuna Tira Yamuna Tira Vanachari Jaya Radha Madhava Kunjabi Hari Jaya Radha Madhava Punjabi Hari Jai Mr. Pad Paramahansa, Padavajakaya Charja, Ashto Tarvata Shri Srimad is Divine Grace, Srila A.C. Bhakti Vedanta Swami Prabhupada Ki Jai, Iskan BBT Founder Acharya Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai. Jai Om Vishnu Pad Paramahansa, Padavajakaya Charja, Ashto Tarvata Shri Srimad is Divine Grace, Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thako Ki Jai, Ananda Koti Vaishnavinda Ki Jai. Nama Charja Srila Haridas Thako Ki Jai Kuntarad Srimad Bhagavatam Ki Jai Samaveta Bhakta Vrinda Ki Jai All glories to the assembled devotees All glories to the assembled devotees All glories to the assembled devotees All glories to Sri Guru and Goranga Narayanam Namaskritya Narang Chaiva Narottamam Devim Saraswatim Vyasam Tator Jaim Hudiriyet Before reciting the Srimad Bhagavatam, which is our very means of conquest, we should offer our respectful obeisances unto Lord Narayan, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, unto Nar Narayan Rishi, the Supermost Human Being, unto Mother Saraswati, the Goddess of Learning, unto Srila Vyasadeva, the author, and unto Srila Prabhupada, the translator, commentator, and our spiritual master. Nashtapayasya Bhadreshu Nityam Bhagavata Sevaya Bhagavat Yuttama Shloke Bhakti Bhavati Naishtiki By regular attendance and classes on Srimad Bhagavatam and by rendering devotional service to the pure devotee, all that is inauspicious within the heart is destroyed almost to nil. And loving devotion to the Supreme Lord, who is glorified in transcendental songs, is established as an irrevocable fact. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. On this 23rd day of March, 2022, in San Diego, we're reading from Srimad Bhagavatam, translation and commentary by His Divine Grace, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada. And we are in chapter, excuse me, Canto 5, The Creative Impetus, chapter 14, The Material World as the Great Forest of Enjoyment. Text number 23. I'll chant it myself. 
अतचतस्माद उभयतापि हिकर्मास्मिन आत्मनः संसारावपनमुधारहंति, which means Learned scholars and transcendentalists, therefore, condemn the materialistic path of fruit of activity because it is the original source and breeding ground of material miseries, both in this life and in the next. That's short enough to repeat. Learned scholars and trans transcendentalists, therefore, condemn the materialistic path of fruit of activity because it is the original source and breeding ground of material miseries, both in this life and in the next. We didn't read this, did we? Okay, purport. Not knowing the value of life, karmis create situations whereby they suffer in this life and the next. Unfortunately, Karmis are very attached to material sense gratification, and they cannot appreciate the miserable condition of material life, neither in this life nor in the next. Therefore, the Vedas enjoin that one should awaken to the spiritual consciousness and utilize all his activities to attain the favor of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. The Lord himself says in the Bhagavad Gita, 9.27, O son of Kunti, all that you do, all that you eat, all that you offer and give away, as well as all austerities that you may perform, should be done as an offering unto me. The results of all one's activities should be utilized not for sense gratification, but for the mission of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. The Supreme Lord gives all information in the Bhagavad Gita about the aim of life, and at the end of the Bhagavad Gita, he demands surrender unto him. People do not generally like this demand, but one who cultivates spiritual knowledge for many births eventually surrenders unto the lotus feet of the Lord. Bohunam janmanamanti Gyanabhanmam papadyate. Om Jnana Timurandas. I'm sorry. I'm going to read the next one. Okay, no, first I'll, I'll, first I'll we'll talk a little about this one. Om Jnana Timurandas. Gyanandana Salakaya. Chokshu unmilatamena tasmai shri gurave namaha. I was born in the darkest of ignorance, but my spiritual master, Srila Prabhupada, opened my eyes with the torchlight of knowledge. I offer my humble obeisance unto him and all members of Sri Parampara. So this verse is a little different than others we've read, since this one tells us some of the conclusion of the instruction that's been given, which is basically painting a very bleak picture of material life uh, in, the, in this so-called forest of so-called enjoyment. Uh, it's one thing after another describing the problems and difficulties and dangers and fears uh, that one has to undergo in a purely materialistic life. We've heard how uh, if, if someone is too much attracted to sex life, then he'll try to have sex with someone else's wife, but then the husband will come after you, and, and uh, maybe you'll get killed or injured. Uh, if one is too greedy, then he'll ste steal something, and the police will come after you, and you'll get thrown in jail. Uh, if you're just trying to live a, a normal life, and not a criminal life or anything bad, but still you're a materialist, then uh, someone else will come and try to steal your wife or steal your property and cause anxiety, one thing after another. And each, word, each one begins, verse, if you, uh, the prose passage begins with the word crutchet, mostly. Sometimes, sometimes, this up, sometimes. This up. So this is the nature of the material world, is that uh, there is there's a, a, a superficial um, opportunity to enjoy, one is naturally inclined to enjoy his senses. That's why we're here in the material world. And, but when you try to do that, then there's a reaction, inevitably, sooner or later. And the, if there's no religion, there's no sense of morality or self-restraint, then it tends to be more and more extreme. And the more and more you try to enjoy the senses, say through drugs or uh, you know, having sex with so many different kind of women, then you'll get, you'll damage your brain through the drugs, damage your body, 
and you come up with some disease in, from you know, lascivious sex with all kinds of uh, partners, and uh, then your life can turn into a pure hell. I remember the other thing that happened in the 80s was the, uh, the AIDS epidemic came out. Yeah, if you remember, that's, that's still going on. And uh, it was just you know, a result of, of crazy sex. And uh, this is the nature of, of the, the world, is that the more that you try to enjoy uh, materially, the more extreme your suffering will be, sooner or later. What does, in this life, what to speak of in the next? That's mentioned in this verse. So when I first read this verse, it's because this was my verse, I said, oh, so now we're coming to the conclusion. But no, in the next verse, he goes back to describing the difficulties of the forest of enjoyment. It's kind of this little uh, interlude. So I wanted to kind of give a, a, another perspective because one thing about the way that, that the, the, the Bhagavatam is presented, we use, you generally uh, read one verse or one paragraph uh, per, per uh, day with Prabhupada's extensive purport, which is fine. This is how he set it up. Um, but, but here, you know, we're going to go on and on and, and continue thinking about this subject of uh, the forest of enjoyment. So, but the Bhagavatam is very vast, and so much of it is encouraging us to take up devotional service and giving us uh, the uh, encouragement by telling us what the result is, what the, how you can really come out of this birth and death cycle full of suffering. So I wanted to read another section of the Bhagavatam at the end of chapter 2. Now the cha chapter of the second canto. Now chapter 2 of the second canto is called the uh, Lord, the change of heart, I believe. But uh, in this, the early part of this canto, there's a description of the, in the universal form. So that's mentioned in this purport I'm going to read. But I want to read a couple of verses. Uh, just the, uh, I'll give you the f first one in Sanskrit, then we'll just read the translations. And then the final verse of the chapter is, I classify it as a nectar verse. And it gives you very much encouragement for uh, hearing about Krishna and, and the result of that. So this is uh, uh, Shukadeva Goswami speaking to Maharaj Pariksit, and he says in text 33 of the second chapter of the second canto, for those who are wandering in the material universe, that's described in the fifth canto we've been reading, there is no more auspicious means of deliverance than what is aimed at evoking the direct devotional service of Lord Krishna. Anyone who's reading along will find that uh, there's a little bit of an edit there. So this is, a, this is a very important conclusion. And then it goes on. Uh, how do we know this? The great personality Brahma, with great attention and concentration of the mind, studied the Vedas three times. And after scrutinizing and examining them, he ascertained that attraction for the supreme personality of Godhead, Sri Krishna, is the highest perfection of religion. That's an important understanding. And then there's this wonderful verse in purport. I won't read this purport, but it's unique in the whole Bhagavatam and all of Prabhupada's writings. Uh, I'll just read the translation first. The personality of Godhead, Lord Sri Krishna, is in every living being along with the individual soul. And this fact is perceived and hypothesized in our acts of seeing and taking help from the intelligence. And in this purport, there's a very logical progression of how we can come to the conclusion that, yes, God is in the heart. And it's based on uh, our, our experience. We all have the experience of the intelligence. This is like if you lose your car keys or something, or your car, the, the key to your apartment. You say, where did I leave that? Right? And you try to dredge your memory, try to trace back. What was I doing? You know, like that. So what's actually going on there? You're trying to hope that your intelligence and your memory is, is, is sharp enough so that you remember where you left it. Right? So this is really, your, it's a prayer. You're, you're, you're not maybe uh, consciously praying to the super soul, but the super soul is the source of your intelligence. From me come remembrance, knowledge, and forgetfulness. Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita. We can all chant that verse. Sarvasicaham mridisan nivishto Sarvasicaham mridivan nivishto Mataks matir gyanam apohanancha so the second line says, 
I am in the heart, first line says, I'm in the heart of everyone as a super soul. And for me comes knowledge, remembrance, and forgetfulness. Knowing that from the Bhagavad Gita, we know that we're trying to remember where we send our car keys, is praying to Krishna, please help me remember, right? From you come remembrance. So the, the purport goes in logically explaining how in our everyday life, if we understand how to think about it, we'll come to the conclusion that God exists and that he's in our heart. Now why was, is this verse here? Uh, because he's winding up the chapter and he's concluding that hearing about Krishna and developing love for Krishna is the goal of life. But then this helps us to believe that there is a God. This verse is, is, helps us to give us a method by which we can sense and understand the presence of the Lord in our heart, giving us direction through our intelligence. So then, then the chapter uh, goes on. There's two more verses. A tasmat, therefore... O king, it is therefore essential that every human being hear about, glorify, and remember the Supreme Lord, the personality of Godhead, always and everywhere. Now, this is, a, this is a, an order. This is an instruction for us. It's essential that every human being hear about, glorify, and remember the Lord, always and everywhere. Always and everywhere means at all times. And if you do it during the day, you'll be doing it in your sleep also. That's also there. So, what is the result of that? Now, this next verse is the one I'm going to read the purport here because it, Prabhupada also talks about the sufferings of human society, and so we're right back in the fifth canon again. Pabandiye bhagavata atmanaksatam katamatam shavanapotesu sambhitam punantite vishayivadusha dashayam vajanti tachadana sodoru hantikam. This is an example from the Bhagavatam of how it, it, we, we learn right in the third verse of the first chapter of the first canto. That this Bhagavatam is the ripened fruit of all of the Vedas. And it's, and it's, 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 it's semi-soft and easily swallowable. That's right in the synonyms. In other words, think of a big ripe mango that's so, so ripe and, and, and sweet and juicy that you have to drink it. You cut into it and you drink it. You're practically drinking it. Therefore, this verse, in that verse uh, in the beginning of the Bhagavatam, says uh, it's the ripened fruit of all the trees of the Vedas and Nigamakal but the Tamkalam Shukamukadamita Devasamitam. It was spoken by Shukadev Goswami. There's a play on words here. Because Shuka means a parrot. And Shukadev Goswami spoke the Bhagavatam. It's understood, I never experienced this, but that if a parrot pecks at a fruit it becomes sweeter. This is part. So this is understood. So the whole Bhagavatam became sweeter. He heard it from his father, but he also added his poetic, uh, you know, touches to it. So Pabanta Bhagavatam Rasamaliam. This is an imperative. Pabanta. This re- verse begins with Pabanti, that those who drink. Pabanta means you drink. It's an imperative form of the verb. <laughs> drink this Bhagavatam. Pabanta Bhagavatam Rasamaliam, which is full of rasa, uh, up to and past the point of liberation. In other words, the, the point of this Bhagavatam is not to give you liberation. That's a byproduct of bhakti. You know, the yogis and the, and the personalists, are, oh, when will be liberated from birth and death? That comes as a natural course. So after you get liberated, keep, keep drinking it. Don't stop drinking. Rasamali and Mohoraho, again and again. Prabhupada had these classes every morning. Mohoraho, Rasika, Bhuvi Bhavaka. All you who can taste rasa, Rasika, become a Rasika. So here is a verse in the end of the second canto, second chapter, where those who do drink the Bhagavatam, here's the result. Uh, you, purify, you purify the polluted aim of life. Now this is vishya vidushatashyam. In, in our evening class in the Bhagavad Gita, we just had the verse vishya vinivartante nadahara sedehina. Rasa vajra masabhyasa padam jishranavajra. Here again with rasa again, but this is material rasa taste. So it says... You can forcibly restrict yourself from the object of the senses. In other words, just like someone on, on the material plane, uh, how, many, how many millions of people in this country at any given time are on a diet to try to lose weight, right? It happens. So that means, oh, I can't eat this, can't eat this, can't eat this. You know, you have to right, clench, your, clench your teeth. So, but the problem is, is that the desire continues there. You're walking past the ice cream shop, no, I'm not going to look, you know. And eventually, just one little ice cream cone. What's the damage, you know? And you're off the, off the, we fall off the wagon, and before you know it, you put on more weight, and you're heavier than you ever were. So, so that's what this verse is about, is that 
you may forcibly restrict yourself from the object of the senses. We know it's not good. I, I know that if I eat this, eat that, you know, if I don't take these drugs, if I smoke, it's not good, so I'm going to quit. Bah, you know, then, you, then something happens in your life and you need to, I need to smoke, you know, to calm my brain. You fall off the wagon. So that's vishyava nivartani nidahara sidehinak, rasa varjam. But the rasa, the taste remains. That's the problem with this renunciation without bhakti doesn't work. So here he's saying that if you, if you drink the Bhagavatam uh, or Katamrita, nectarian words, which are just uh, about, about the Lord, through your, through your ears, you're drinking through the ears here, and you're fully satisfied, then you will purify your, your heart of vishyam dushita ashiyam, the polluted aim of life. Ashiyam means your goal in life. And it's vidushita, it's uh, polluted, which is vishya, the sense, sense gratification. In other words, you become purified, you're sublimated, you're, you're, and what's the result? Vajanti tachadana sadoru hantikam. You go back to Godhead and you take a place near the lotus feet of Krishna eternally for service. Now what does Prabhupada say in the purport for this wonderful ber- verse? The sufferings of human society are due to a polluted name of life, namely lording it over the material resources. The more human society engages in the exploitation of undeveloped material resources for sense gratification, the more it will be entrapped by the illusory material energy of the Lord, and thus the distress of the world will be intensified instead of diminished. So this is right from the mood of the fifth cano, and it's right out of the headlines you know, of what's happening today in the world. It's always happening. The human necessities of life are fully supplied by the Lord in the shape of food, grains, milk, fruit, wood, stone, sugar, silk, jewels, cotton, salt, water, vegetables, etc. In abundant quantity to feed the care of, for the human race, feed and care for the human race of the world, as well as the living beings on each and every planet within the universe. The supply source is complete, Om Purnamadak Purnamidam, and only a little energy by the human being is required to get these necessities into the proper channel. There is no need of machines and tools or huge, or huge steel plants for artificially creating comforts of life. What to speak of the oil wells and the refineries and the, uh, you know, that's, we know what's going on. Life is never made comfortable by artificial needs, but by plain living and high thinking. The highest perfectional thinking for human society is suggested here by Shukadev Goswami, namely, repeated and abundant hearing of Srimad Bhagavatam. <laughs> for men in this age of Kali, when they have lost the perfect vision of life, this Srimad Bhagavatam is the torchlight by which to see the real path. Srila Jiva Goswami Prabhupada, has commented on the Katamritam mentioned in this verse and has indicated that Srimad Bhagavatam is the, is the nectarian message of the personality of Godhead. By abundant hearing of Srimad Bhagavatam, the polluted aim of life, namely lording it over matter, will subside and the people in general and all sorts of the world will be able to live a peaceful a life of knowledge and bliss. For a pure devotee of the Lord, any topics in relation with his name, fame, quality, entourage, etc. are all pleasing. And because such topics have been approved by great devotees like Narada Muni, Hanuman, Nanda Maharaj, and other inhabitants of Vrindavan, certainly such messages are transcendental and pleasing to the heart and soul. And by the constant hearing constant hearing of the messages of the Bhagavad Gita and later Bhagavatam, one is assured herein by Shukadeva Goswami that he will reach the personality of Godhead and render him transcendental loving service in the spiritual planet Goloka Vrindavan, which resembles a huge lotus flower. Thus, by the process of bhakti yoga, directly accepted as suggested in this verse by abundant hearing of the transcendental message of the Lord, the material contamination is directly eliminated without one's attempting to contemplate the impersonal Virat conception of the Lord. And by practicing bhakti yoga, if the performer is not purified from the material contamination, he must be a pseudo-devotee. For such an imposter, there is no remedy for being freed from the material entanglement. <laughs> Very interesting purport. Rich, rich. So this is the, the counterbalance. In other words, what we're reading again and again and again in the forest of material enjoyment. And what it should be instilling in us is a very jaundiced view of trying to live a material life, the, the ordinary life. Because it, it, it results in so much misery, fear, anxiety, and ultimately you die and you're reborn, maybe be so sinful that you, that you lose your human life, which is very possible in this age. And so you just prolong the agony of material uh, existence. But we've, we've been given the means 
of uh, curing that propensity to try to enjoy separately from Krishna. And we, we understand uh, viscerally, if you will, by practicing Krishna consciousness, by chanting, by the deity's life, that there are wonderful, uh, wonderful joy to be had there. Happiness, transcendental happiness. We, we should aspire for that. That's not that all, no. That's, that's, that's what we should aspire for. We should be greedy for that, but understand the, the steps from here to there to, to be able, able to experience it. Yes, it requires discipline, it requires austerity, it requires renunciation, but they're possible to perform by, uh, following, by following the orders of the spiritual master, Srila Prabhupada. When I say our spiritual master, every time I begin the class, I'm not talking about me. I'm talking about all of us. That Srila Prabhupada is a spiritual master. He's the instructing spiritual master for everybody, whether they're initiated or not by him. What, what books are we studying? What, what instructions are we, we following when we worship the deity, when we cook? It's all coming from Prabhupada. Uh, so, the, back to the fifth canto, and uh, the conclusion of this particular verse Learned scholars and transcendent therefore condemn the materialistic path of food of activity because it is the original source and breeding ground of material miseries, both in this life and the next. And they condemn it because people are missing out. This is the whole idea of, of, of preaching, of giving Christian consciences out, is that you're experiencing, to whatever degree, the relief of Krishna consciousness, the, the, the peace, the joy, the progressive uh, development of knowledge, and the sense of meaning to your life. In other words, it's, it's, it, we feel saved. We should feel that we have been rescued from the, the worst danger by this compassionate person, Srila Prabhupada and his, his, his sincere followers. And so we should want to give it out. We should want to give it to others. This is what, what it means to be a sadhu. You know, we'll meditate on this verse for, for a minute now. This is describing, described by Lord Kapiladev, Tatikshava, Karunika, Suridak sarva dehinam, ajata shatavak shanta sadavak sadubushana. So sadubushana means here's the ornaments, the char- character, the, ca- the ornaments of the, of the character. The first is tolerance. Tolerance is so rare today, even rarer than it was, you know, several years ago. Uh, this pa- pandemic is putting everyone on edge and everyone's, a lot of people get very angry because their life, whatever it was, has been restricted and, you know, all this stuff. So uh, there's so many more shootings going on and horrible things, you know, happening. You all know about this. So someone who's a gross materialist can't be tolerant because his whole focus is on pleasing himself and or his loved ones. But uh, inevitably, the material world uh, makes that more difficult. There's sometimes horrible things happen or sometimes just ordinary difficulties. And so tolerance is not a quality of the materialists. Um, but it is of the sadhus. It is the real sadhus. Uh, the sadhus means devotees. It's, that's described in this, in this p- passage from Kapila, by Kapila Dev. So tatikshiva so, karunika. If you're really going to be merciful, this word means merciful or compassionate. Well, how can you be compassionate? The only, the only really way of being compassionate is by working to give uh, Krishna consciousness to others. It's the only hope where how their, their, their miseries can be relieved, not only in this life, but forever. What can, how can there be a greater gift than that, a greater act of, of charity? It's not. Prabhupada often said this is the greatest welfare work, and there's no question about it. So, but, but just, you know, the example of Jesus Christ shows, and many devotees uh, after him and before him, that uh, you, it, the, the demons certainly don't want to hear it, right? Really somebody, the, the last thing they want to do is to hear that they should surrender unto Krishna, because they want to be God. So, therefore, there's danger, and you have to be tolerant for verbal and even physical, op, uh, you know, uh, opposition, uh, so that, that's, that's a, another quality of the sadhu. The merciful and tolerant. Surida sarva dehinam. Surida, as I was explaining last night, I think it was the last night or the previous night, uh, is, a, is a, the friend. Uh, Prabhupada would, would sign his letters, your ever well wisher. So a surida is someone who always has your best interests at, mind, at heart. What kind of a friend, huh? Who always wants to help you and, 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 and give you things. <laughs> 
So Krishna's in the heart, and he claims at the end of the fifth chapter, Bhoktaram yagita basang sarva loka maheshim suridam sarva bhutanam gyatvamam shantam ishiti. So if you know that your best friend is with you at all times, and he wants to help you, doesn't that give you a sense of peace? This is the peace formula. <laughs> but you have to know that Krishna is really the ultimate enjoyer, that he's the master of the universe and so forth, and, but that he's our best friend. Isn't it nice to have your best friend be the master of the universe? Yeah. Then if you, you can pray to him, and he can actually... <laughs> so that, uh, so, the, so the, the devotee who's really um, uh, advanced and you know, pure, He's also the Surida Sarvadehinam of body and souls. Ajata Shattva, he himself has no enemy. Now, this is a little difficult because in, in, in English, uh, when you have an enemy, it means that they hate you and you hate them. That's the meaning of the word enemy. But not in Sanskrit. In Sanskrit, you can, you can have no enemy, but someone can think of you as an enemy. You see what I'm saying? And that's what happens with the devotees. Uh, certainly, uh, Hiranyakashipu thought that Pallad was his enemy, his own, his own son, because he was a devotee. He was, and he was not only that, but he was um, subverting the whole uh, uh, mood, of the demonic mood in the society. He was teaching his friends about Krishna consciousness, and they were the next generation. So that's a very dangerous. And so the, the, those who are demons, they always try to eradicate the devotees. So... Ajata uh, Shatra, but on his part, he has no en enmity. Therefore, he has no enemy. You see the, the way the word works? No enmity. And this is a perfect example, as Prabhupada gave and cited, Jesus Christ. Even on the cross, he was saying, please forgive them, Father. They don't know what they're doing. He was forgiving them. Otherwise, he couldn't ask his Father to do that, his God to do that. You see? But of course, that God is not so you know, readily forgiving. He <laughs> annihilates the demons who are tormenting his devotees, like the Shringadev. But, uh, so, ajata shatava shanta because he has no material desires, you can be peaceful. What is that verse? Krishna bhakta nishkama ata eva shanta bhukti mukti siddhi kami sikali ashanta that the Krishna bhakta has no material desires and is therefore peaceful. But those who are bhukti mukti siddhi kami, kami means that they're ardently desiring bhukti, that's the vast mass of people, those are the Prabhupada refers to in this uh, purport as the karmis, those who are performing fruit of active for enjoyment, uh, they are certainly not peaceful. But also the uh, bhukti mukti siddhi kamis, those who are uh, desirous, probably you know, use that word a lot, of liberation. I want liberation. Now this is, this is uh, the impersonalist. This is their goal, their final goal in life. Freedom from birth and death. Merging into Brahman. No more birth, no more disease, no more old age. You know. But no more enjo you know, normal enjoyment either. In other words, no relationship, nothing. They're also not peaceful because their liberation is not secure. This is the verse I couldn't remember the other day. Yen ye rabindaksa vimukta bhainanas tryasta bhava davishuddha buddhaya aruha kritchena parang padang tata patang jado anadusha yushmarangriya. Is that the demigods are praying to Krishna in the womb. And uh, this is one of the verses. Besides your bhaktas, there are others. Yen ye rabindaksa vimukta bhainanas tryasta lord. Uh, who, because of their philosophy and their practice, they think that they're liberated. It's in the mind, but they're not really. But mukta maninas. But their intelligence, their consciousness is not purified because they're opposed to serving you. Tryashta bhavad avishuddha buddhaya. And even if a few of them, not all, by severe austerity can repress the senses and somehow uh, not, not engage in sense gratification and meditate, they can go up to the parampadam. They can achieve brahma uh, bhuta, you know, this uh, position. But, they fall down again because they're averse to serving your lotus feet. They're not enjoying any bhakti rasa, any spiritual pleasure. It's all negative. It's just like if, you, if, if the example is you're in the hospital, you had an accident, and you're, 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 your leg is in traction. You have a broken leg, right? So there's pain, there's discomfort, 
uh, you know, you can't do anything. And so all you can think about is when am I getting out of this hospital? When am I, will my leg heal up? And it, you're in there for weeks, you know, and eventually the doctors come out and say, okay, you're well enough, you can now go out of the hospital. Oh, thank God, you know. So you go out of the hospital. So what, what do you do then? Do you just sit on the curb and say, now my life is perfect. You know, I'm out of the hospital. No. <laughs> you resume your previous life, right? <laughs> so similarly, if uh, you, 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 you get to the uh, Brahma, Brahma Loka, Brahma Bhuta platform, then uh, it's not that, oh, now my life is perfect. What am I going to do now? You know? What do I, have to re- I have to resume my previous life, my spiritual life in the spiritual world. So because they're not, they're averse to God, they, they don't want, you know, the impersonalists, they eventually come back down again to engage in, you know, wealth, mundane welfare activity, probably to point it. So, so that's the, uh, the problem. Mukti Kamis, the Mukti Kamis, they're not peaceful either because their Mukti is unsure. And, uh, you know. and then there's the Siddhi Kamis, the yogis. There's, another, there's like four different categories of people. There's the Karmis, the vast, vast majority, just the out and out uh, materialists. But there's also those who are supposedly spiritualists. They practice uh, Shtanga Yoga. And, and, uh, the, and the, those who are practicing uh, impersonal uh, realization, mostly reading Vedanta Sutra, like that. And so you have the Bukti, Mukti, Siddhi, Kamis. The Bukti, Kamis are the, are the ordinary Karmis. You've got to make it a different word. Uh, but then there's those who want liberation uh, and those who want mystic cities. means that you can become smaller than the smallest. You can walk on water, so meaning that there's, there's some evidence that Jesus Christ went to India and learned yoga, you know, so he could walk on water. But in any case, but he was, a, you know, a bhakta, obviously. Uh, and then there's the, 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 those who want uh, liberation in the city. So there's four categories. So none of them are peaceful except the devotees because they're kamis. They, they're full of kama, material desire, which includes desire for liberation, desire for mystic cities. So... But, but, the, but the sadhu is, is shanta. He's peaceful. Because he's a bhakta. This is one of the... Uh, ajata shatuda shanta sadhu bhakta bhushana. And, and Prabhupada adds that he follows the uh, instructions of the shastra. So this is the, the qualities of the devotee. And uh, we, we want to cultivate those qualities. That's the only way to be happy and peaceful. They go together. You can't be happy if, if you're not peaceful. And you can't be peaceful if you're not happy. The, the devotees uh, are enjoying the pleasure within. That's in the Bhagavad Gita. By, by chanting Hare Krishna, serving Krishna, they're enjoying a pleasure that is unknown to the impersonalists, what, what to speak of, the karmis, and even the, the mystic cities. That's, that's the pleasure of bhakti, bhakti rasa. And that's what's happening in the spiritual world. So if you're, if you're situated in that pleasure, you can become so tolerant. Look at Pallad. I mean, it's inconceivable how tolerant he was. How tolerant would we be if we're thrown into a, a, a vat of boiling oil? Or would we just keep chanting Hare Krishna? <laughs> but that's what he did. He was protected from injury, and he was happily chanting and meditating on Krishna fully. He was protected. So that's, that's the, uh, the, the alternative here. And this section of the Bhagavatam we've been reading is describing all the different ways in which you can have misery. I mean, let's, let's just be honest. You know, we're hoping it won't happen and that Krishna won't let it happen. But there's, there's a higher chance now of nuclear war than, that I've read than even in the Cuban Missile Crisis, you know, that, that, which was like pretty you know, diff- uh, dangerous. So this is the material world. Anything can happen. And even if that doesn't happen, eventually disaster in our own life will happen. You get, you get old, you die. If you don't have Krishna, can you can imagine dying without some devotees trying to make you, help you remember Krishna? You know, it's just a nightmare. All your karma, all your sinful activity, just ordinary life in this material world. All of that's coming at you, and the, and the, and the Yamadudas are coming, you know? And suddenly uh, you realize, but it's too late. It's too late to do anything about it. You know, so that's that's what material life is all about. It's miserable even when you before you die, and when you die in the sinful state of mind, it's it's just so horrible. And and this canto uh, ends with a, a description of a, a small portion of the hells that one can uh, experience for specific sinful activities. 
illicit sex, you know, it's so common today, people don't even think about it, twice about it. Uh, you're forced to embrace a uh, red hot iron form of the opposite sex for who knows how many thousands of years, you know. And you don't die because you don't have a material body, you have just a mind, it's just a subtle body. You can experience that horrible. Or for, I forget what it is, you get thrown off a cliff repeatedly, I forget what that one is. If you, if you like lobsters, you know, I, I, I tell this story, I used to live in, uh, in near New York and I'd sometimes go into the city and you know, I'd go into the mid midtown, have all these expensive restaurants. And one of them, uh, some, or some of them, they, they serve lobster. You know, it's a delicacy. And I'll actually show you how fresh it is. Right in the window, you see a little uh, fish tank. And in the fish tank is a, is a lobster, it's still alive, you know. So, oh, yeah, meaning that we take the live lobster and put them right into the... Whoa, you know, I mean, <laughs> I was never... Even as a karmi, I never was even thinking that I would want to do that, eat something like that. I never had lobster. But uh, there's, a, there's a hell for that. There's a hell for that. Well, you get boiled in oil for 10 million years. You know, how would you like it? You know, and what goes around comes around. It's coming from the fifth canto. So after all of these descriptions of the hells, then we have the beginning of the sixth canto, first chapter. And Parikit Maharaj, who's a, a soft-hearted devotee, he wants to know how can people be saved from this terrible punishment? He's asking Shukadeva Goswami. So Shukadeva Goswami, he tests Maharaj Parikshit. He gives a, what's called a prayas chitta answer. Meaning that, yes, there's ways that you can atone. He doesn't talk about bhakti. There's, in the Vedas, the ways you can atone for the sins before death so you don't have to suffer in the hells, you know. But Maharaj Pariksit, he passes the test. He says, well, that doesn't sound very good. Precisely because by that atonement, you're not uprooting the seed of desire to perform the sinful activities. So you may atone for one sin, but then you're ready to do another sin or that same sin again. It's just the same thing as going on a diet and then falling off the wagon and having a, you know, a whole gallon of ice cream. The desire isn't there. You know, you're benefiting from you know, losing the weight, or you're benefiting from losing the sin for reaction, but you still desire to perform the sin. It's like an elephant's bathing, kundra shochavit. So then how to get free? Chant the holy name. The whole chapter and the section is about the, the glories of chanting the holy name. And they give an example of a jamil. A jamil was, was, was uh, a devotee, Brahman, He's the Brahmin. And he was out in the forest gathering uh, wood uh, for uh, his guru to perform, a, or his father to perform a sacrifice. And he saw a low class couple embracing having sex out in the forest. You know? and, he, and he lost his uh, equipoise. You know? And he, he married that prostitute who was there. And for a whole lifetime, he became a dacoit and he became a, you know, a crook and performing all kinds of sins. And he was having sex into his 80s. He has a, he's in, a, 80, in his 80s and is a little boy named... But, but he had the presence of mind to name his children, at least the last one, after uh, the Lord. So his name was Narayan, right? So uh, now it's time for Ajamil to die, right? And the Yamadutas, they're the, the, the agents of Yamaraj. They look horrible. They're scary, you know. And uh, so they were coming to, to drag the, the, the soul out of the body and take it to Yamaraj for punishment. That's what happens when you, you're very sinful. So he was seeing this and he was frightened. He was seeing them coming at him. So he called out to his son, the little boy, four years old, Narayan! You see? And he, didn't, he, didn't, he wasn't uh, chanting offensive, offensively. He wasn't even chanting. You know, this is, this is part of my English uh, thing. Chanting means repeatedly. We chant Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna. But you can't chant if you chant once, if you utter it once. He uttered the holy name in great desperation, and, and, you know, but it was purely. And so right away, immediately, uh, that second, the Vishnu Dudas came and said to the Yamadudas, Halt! You can't take him now. He's pure. But they didn't know the power of the name. They didn't know the science. So they said, what are you talking about? He spent a whole life as a sinful activity. Our, our master, Yamaraj, told us to get him and bring him for punishment. Who are you guys? But they were powerful and they were awesome. So they really, you know, they respected them and they stopped. And then uh, the, Yama, the Yamadudas go back to Yamaraj to ask for an explanation and he starts explaining the power of the holy name. And the whole chapter is about that. So, uh, but, but interestingly, Ajamiya was not ready to go back to Godhead, you see. In other words, you save from the sin 
But that doesn't mean you have pure love for God. So anybody can chant, and it's, it's great. You know, go out on Harinam and get people to chant, uh, even derisively. You see that? People, what, are you, what are you Hare Krishnas doing anyway? Don't you, why don't you get a job? But they said Hare Krishna. You see? <laughs> and, then you said, and the devotees become ecstatic when that happens. <laughs> what to speak of giving books out? The people who can, under, you know, can understand and that they can really make progress. But even if they just say that one time, they're free of sin. The sinful reactions eradicated. But the problem is, is that, you know, they're still, the, the fan is still moving. Their propensity for sin is there, and they, they go back, start a new series of sins. So it's, it's good, but it's better if they can uh, become interested to in, in investigate, because you have to, impro- you have to engage your mind, your intelligence. Atato Brahma Jigyasa, you know, to engage, uh, to investigate. And then you, be, you can become uh, you know, interested in practicing the process and actually becoming a devotee. That's how we all became devotees. So that's, that's what uh, this is about. We're in the middle of this chapter and uh, the Bhagavatam is full of sections like I read encouraging us to uh, hear the Bhagavatam, chant the holy name. There's a lot about chanting the holy name in the Bhagavatam. I was pointed out uh, last night, was it? Or the other day, that the last verse of the Bhagavatam talks about Nam Sankirtan, the very last verse, Nama Sankirtanam Yasya. So that's significant. The last instruction is always very important. Sarva Dharma So, uh, are there any comments, questions at this time? It's, I, I kind of sprung that on you. But, uh, Hare Krishna Prabhu, we have a one, uh, one person in queue in Zoom. And on, on Zoom, there's somebody who wants to ask a question? Yes, he's in queue. They're in the queue, is that what you're saying? Yes, Prabhu. Okay. Well, there's a queue of one at this point. <laughs> okay. Yeah, we'll take that question or comment. Yes, Dravida uh, oh, Prabhu. Um, what a uh, surprise. Go ahead. Go uh, ahead, Vijay. Uh, thank you very much. You're very kind. Uh, my question is, why is it that people in general do not like to surrender to Krishna? It's a good question. Thank you. Well, the reason is is that the reason why they're here is because they rejected Krishna. This is one of my favorite verses, Bayam Duti Smriti, is that fear arises as soon as one uh, becomes absorbed in the in the dualities of this material world, having turns one back on the Lord. Ishama Petasya. Isha means Krishna, the supreme controller, and we turn away from him and we become absorbed in this material world. And then the, the mind is, is infected with the modes of nature. You read about the modes of nature in the 14th chapter especially. And what happens when the mode of passion is there? Well, you want to enjoy like anything. That's why it's called the mode of passion. Your senses are on fire and your mind is always thinking, how can I get more money so I can enjoy more and more? So you're absorbed in that. And uh, the last thing someone like that wants to hear is that, you know, you're paving your way to hell, you know. I mean, yeah, it's, it's, uh, you're going to suffer like anything, both in this, this life and the next. They said, you know, I have, a, you know, they said, get, get out of my way. I want to, you know, I'm going to buy this and do this, and, you know. In other words, if you're in that mentality, and, and th- this is why even, even uh, you know, there's, there's other religion besides uh, the Hare Krishna religion, besides Nipur Bhakti. We have so many, and, and it's, uh, all of it, genuine religions, they have a sense that uh, just out-and-out hedonism is going is to experience great suffering by doing that. And that there's a sense of morality and self-control and we want to go to heaven, you know, and be with God and become... But then you have, to, you have to go to church and you have to pray and you have to, you know... In other words, the, the, the central idea of religion is, is there even in other religions. But if they don't have the full science of bhakti, then uh, it becomes a cheating religion. It, it easily d- devolves into, oh, come to us and pray uh, for your material necessities. And then it's a kind of a little perverted reflection of what Krishna says in the, uh, is it the fourth chapter? Chattu Bhadha Bhajanta Imam Jana Sukhutana Arjuna. No. 
Or is that the seventh chapter? I always forget that. Yeah, seven. Uh, there are four kinds of uh, pious people who come to me. Those who want material things, uh, arto, uh, those who are in trouble, arto is the, those who are in, in pain or suffering. Just like there's a famous phrase, we haven't heard it for a while. You know this one, Balaram. There's no atheist in the foxholes. You know what that means? Is that when things get really, really horrible, then everybody calls out to God, please save me. You know, it's in foxholes in World War I, you know, the bombs are going over you, you're ducking down trying to survive. People say, God, please help, help. All my life I've neglected you, but now I realize, you know, I need you. <laughs> That's the <laughs> So the, the, um, the, the, uh, the materialist has uh, absorbed, he, he, you're completely absorbed and engrossed in the material mentality. And because of that uh, uh, engrossment, uh, one, one needs an outside force, an intervention. This is what Prabhupada saw. This is all genuine. In order to preach, you're, you're intervening on, be, on behalf of the Lord in someone's uh, life uh, and trying to give them things. And that's why it's a thankless test because many people, they're, 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 they're too stubborn. They've, they develop a philosophy re rejecting religion. Oh, religion is just a, you know, as, as a... a uh, a device in order to try to uh, uh, hope that, you, that there's, a, there's a heaven after life, you know. But we know that, scientifically, we know that there's, there's nothing like that. And that it, it's, you go around once in life, and you have to grab all the gusto you can get. There used to be an advertisement for beer like that. Uh, but, no, but the first lesson, the very first lesson is, no, you don't go around once. You never die. And you've been in, you, you, this, is not, this is one small chapter in a very long book. And you have one, you have a, a chance now to, you know, change the plot, you know. So, you're not <laughs> so, so that's 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 why people they don't believe in reincarnation. That's why they don't want to they, they don't want to be, uh, you know, take up devotion or be receptive. That's that's a big thing. So that's why reincarnation is you know coming back is such an important book, convincing people yes. And there are even there are even material uh, evidences of it. I remember Ian Stevenson. I don't know if that name rings a bell. This was he was in the '60s. He was a psychologist, but he had heard about you know, uh, you know children in India, something who were remembering past lives or their past life, and there was evidence for it. So he went in India and investigated. And he found sure enough, there were some of these these children there. They're saying, "You're not my real mother. You know, I belong to this family." And said, "Really?" And so they'd go, you know, 50 miles away or 40 miles away, and they'd find. Uh, the family, yes, who's somebody died, an aunt died, you know, when her name was this, and it's co corroborated. And so he said, this, is, so he wrote a book, 20 uh, cases uh, indicative of the reincarnation. In other words, there is empirical evidence, plus all this uh, near-death experience that they've had. Doctors can say, yeah, you know, my, my patient knew he, he, he was under anesthesia, and we did open-heart surgery, and then later on he came by and he told us which doctor was in the room, and, you know, what was going on? And this, because he's in the subtle body, floating up in the ceiling and watching it all. So anyway, uh, that, that the, the reason is why people are, are so um, averse is because they're in illusion. They're, they're covered over. You know, you can be covered over just like some intoxication. You're not yourself. So nobody is his, himself. He's not, he's not understanding his true self in the material world. Prabhupada would like to quote this one verse at the end of the seventh chapter as proof of how we fell from the spiritual world. Itcha dresha samutena dvanda mohena bharata sarvabhutani samoham sarge yanti parantaba. The last line means they come into the creation. Sarge is this creation that we have. Yanti, they go. We go into the creation by itcha and dresha. Itcha means we want to enjoy separately from Krishna. Dvesha means we don't want to serve him anymore. We're, we're, we're refusing the service. But that gives rise to the delusion of duality, the, all of this, this uh, illusory energy, our absorption illusion. Samutena dvandva mohena bharata, and mohana means bewildered. It's the spell of maya. It's the spell of illusion. That's why people are averse to, to Krishna consciousness. So that's the answer. We want to come out of that spell. We want to wake up and come to our real consciousness. And that, that is, a lot of that is, comes about from hearing. 
hearing the Bhagavad Gita, hearing the Srimad Bhagavatam, and trying to live according to its tenets. Their tenets. Okay? Yes, uh, Dravida Prabhu, if I may, I liked it when you said uh, that there are no atheists uh, in the fox's holes. Yeah, not the, fox, the foxhole. The fo they call the foxhole the, the trenches where the soldiers are crouching, trying to avoid getting their head blown off in the, in the war. I don't know if they have them anymore, but uh, in World War I it was very prominent. So there's no atheist means that even someone who is an atheist, you know, in a helpless condition, he's crying out to God also. That's, that's true. You know. Yes, Prabhu, that was great. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna. Hare Bol. Hare Bol. Okay, we can adjourn. All glories to Srila Prabhupada. Hare Bol. And tomorrow, more miseries of the material world. We're not through the chapter yet. <laughs> <laughs>